Welcome back to Let's Code. Today we've got this little infinite pong game. So if I full screen this, you can see there's two balls running and when they hit the opposite colored tiles, those tiles switch to the other side. This will just go infinitely. I've set it up to be 16 by nine at the moment, but you could set it up to be any size of tile grid, any size tiles, and they just kind of compete like this forever. So first things first, Pong can be easily built without any additional dependencies. But I did think that this was a really interesting use case for looking into Bevy ECS tile map, which has an entity per tile sort of configuration, we'll call it. And then looking at building collision on top of that tile set. So we use Bevy XPBD 2D for the collision, and we're using Bevy ECS tile map for this entire grid, which is constructed dynamically. Now, because it is physics based, there are situations in which this simulation can degenerate. And because we're using a whole physics library for the collision detection here, uh, the trade-off is that we don't have to write the collision logic, but we do have to configure everything appropriately and then detect collisions at the appropriate time and so on and so forth. So first things first, if I enable this physics debug plugin, we get to see all of the colliders individually. Now this is putting a sort of like little XY marker on the rectangular or square collider for each of the tiles. There are also colliders on the balls which have the same debug properties. The sort of game or application is not terribly complicated in terms of the number of systems we're using. We've got one startup system and then a ball collision detection system. Other than that, we're just changing the name of the window title, setting the way we wanna sample our images and setting gravity to zero, which is very important because we don't actually have gravity in this simulation. The crates we're using to do this, again, are Bevy ECS tile map and Bevy XPBD 2D. Bevy ECS tile map is the tile map crate that I reach for anytime I wanna do anything with say LDTK or another tile-based map editor, level editor. It includes a whole bunch of functionality. We don't use any of the complicated stuff today. We mostly use what would be in this basic.rs file here. And then our other major crate is Bevy XPBD, which will undergo a rename in the near future. We're using this mostly for the colliders, so we could write our velocity and write a system for velocity if we wanted to, but I chose today to also use the rigid bodies and the physics simulation. So basically the two major things we need to do are in our startup system, place everything onto the screen, and then in our constantly running update system, determine when tiles should flip back and forth between the two teams. One really interesting note here is that because of the way we've set up all of these colliders, they're all on different layers and they interact with other layers. So we'll get into this a little bit later, but player one's ball doesn't interact with player two's colliders. That's why we can get this you know, blue ball hanging out over the green squares, not having any issues, and the green ball hanging out over the blue squares, not having any issue, but both of them collide with the other team's tiles. It starts off pretty simply. We define our, the size of our map. In this case, it is 16 by nine times two, so it's 32 by 18 tiles. You can verify that by counting horizontally and vertically. I chose to use a 16 by nine aspect ratio for these tiles because I intended to full screen this for the eventual video that I was going to make, and I wanted it to fit on 4K perfectly. Now the tile size itself is 16, so each of these tiles is quote 16 by 16. The reason it doesn't quite look like that exactly is because we have set a custom orthographic projection. The far and the near values here for our projection on our camera are the same default values you would get if this whole camera 2D bundle was just the default values. Big thing here is the scaling mode. So the scaling mode allows us to set basically what happens to our game as it's put into different situations. In this case, we're using fixed, which sets a fixed width and height inside of our application that we want the viewport to snap to effectively. So as you can see in the documentation, if we do that, if we specify a width and a height that matches the tiles, then our camera viewport will always match the tiles and the tile map exactly. But if our window stretches, then the image will stretch. So I can actually make this, let's say as tall as I want to, and you'll see that everything stretches vertically or as wide as I want to and everything stretches horizontally but that's not affecting any of the actual collision or the logic that's happening in this game. It's just how we're showing it to the user. We do have a number of other options, including, for example, keeping the aspect ratio. 
However, I was playing around with this being, you know, a square or 16 by nine or in any number of other grid configurations. So that's why I used fixed. Next, we load in a set of tiles from a PNG. So if we look at tiles.png and I zoom way in because it's very small, you can see that it is six tiles effectively. We're going to use this as a bit of a texture atlas. So you can see that all the tiles on the left are index zero and all the tiles on the right are index one. For Bevy ECS tile map, we want to create our tile map entity because the tiles that we're going to create and fill the map with need some reference to that entity. And then I'm using the main branch of Bevy ECS tile map. So this is running on my local host for documentation purposes. But the tile storage we create is used to store the tiles so that we can look them up or more accurately so that the plugin can look them up. So to get the colliders to work correctly, there's an interesting difference in what we're doing here versus what you'll find in say the Bevy ECS tile map examples. In this case, we're parenting everything to this tile map entity, which is semi required. We're also taking some utility helper functions that Bevy ECS tile map provides us, such as where the center for this tile position in the world is. And we're using that for the actual transform. So technically speaking, we don't need with children here, but in this case, I've used it because we are already setting the transform. So we iterate over the map size, X and Y values, all the way horizontally, all the way vertically. For each of those, we create a new tile position. We get the center of that tile in the world according to the map size and whatnot. This is again provided to us by Bevy ECS tile map. We create the tile entity. So this builder would otherwise be commands if you're used to using Bevy. But since we're using with children, we get this thing called a child builder. Using the builder, we spawn in a tile bundle, which is something we need. We spawn in the transform, which is what our colliders are going to use to position themselves on screen. And then we do some bevy XPBD 2D to make it so that the tiles are static and they don't move around the screen. As we'll see later, the balls are uh, dynamic rigid bodies. So they're impacted and they can move around the screen and bounce off stuff and whatnot. There are two really important things here for this demo's purposes. And that's our starting state. So to create our starting state of green tiles on the left, blue tiles on the right, all I'm doing is saying everything that is less than half of the map size is going to be sort of the left-hand side. So the tile texture index zero, that is that green tile from tiles.png that we saw earlier, or tile texture one, which is blue. And we do the same logic for the collision layers. Now collision layers are really interesting because they allow us to define what layer each of these colliders lives on and then what layer they collide with. This is really the key to making these balls bounce around the screen and not interact with the tiles that we don't want them to interact with. This is also the thing that we dynamically change whenever they hit one. So when a uh, blue ball hits a blue tile and it switches to green, we need to swap these collision layers so that it now wants to interact with the other ball. And then we've add this tile entity that we've created to the tile storage and we move on. But that is fundamentally how we're setting up our tiles and the collision layers and the colors are the really important things for this demo. Up at the top here, remember we set tile size in addition to map size. So we need a bunch of those values down here. We need the grid size. We're inserting a tile map bundle, which is something Bevy ECS tile map gives us. We're inserting the map type, the size of the map, the tile storage we used to just shove all those tiles into. In this case, we're also specifying the texture that holds the indexes or indices that we want to actually use, the size of each tile, and where the center of this tile map should be, and everything else we just leave default. We insert that tile map, and that's what draws in our tile map over here. We then move on to spawning in the balls. So we've got our tile map, and we've got colliders for each tile, but we haven't spawned in the balls yet. And also importantly, we haven't built a boundary around the outside to keep the balls in this grid. So I started using a Material Mesh 2D bundle for each of the balls because I was considering maybe writing a shader in the future. In this case, we're just using a simple color for each of them. The player ball mesh is a circle that we've created from a certain radius. In this case, the radius roughly mirrors the size of a tile. The transform is completely arbitrary. I chose to go with chunking the map size into four and then offsetting it to either side. So it's kind of like on the quarter line on the left and on the quarter line on the right for the start of each of these balls. The dynamic rigid body is why these balls are bouncing around the screen. Each of them gets a circle collider that matches the material mesh 2D here. We give each one a linear velocity. You'll see that one goes in the exact opposite direction of the other, which gives some interesting symmetry when the game starts. We also specify the collision layers. 
In this case, we're saying that one ball belongs to the player one layer and interacts with colliders on the player two or the all layer. In this case, the only thing that's on the all layer is the bounding box around the whole screen. Restitution and friction. We made the trade-off here of actually using a physics library. So we need to make sure that we are not losing any elasticity when we bounce off of things and that friction isn't taking away any of our velocity for these walls because otherwise the walls will just stop over time. And I've set some combined rules here so that we make sure that whenever these walls interact with something, they have the best opportunity to take either the high restitution or the low friction value. But as you can see here on the right, this has been running for a little bit and it's kind of degenerated over time. I do think with a little bit of extra work here that this could get cleaned up and this could run for longer, but this was just a fun one hour project for me. So I wasn't too concerned about it. Another option here is to not actually use the physics library itself and to write your own collision code and your own velocity handling code or making sure that these balls have some randomness applied if they're going too slow or minimum speeds and things like that. But let me go back up to the orthographic projection and add an extra hundred to each value and then restart our little game. And if I do that, you can see that there's actually a line around the entire outside of the game. So the aspect ratio is off a little bit, but we're seeing now that there is, well, maybe you can't see it. Maybe this is a little too small, <laughs> but we could say remove the collider from each of the tiles and restart. And you can now see that we have just this one line around the outside, which we're going to talk about in a second. And that actually the balls are not interacting with uh, any colliders on the tiles because the colliders on the tiles don't exist. So to achieve this line around the border after we've spawned in these balls, we take the map size times the tile size over two, and we create a polyline. This polyline allows us to define each of the vertices. I've chosen to define the bottom left, the top left, the top right, and the bottom right in order. So that's what this vertice list is. I've divided the entire map size into two and said negative X, negative Y, negative X, positive Y, and so on. So it's the same ordering. And then to finish off the full box, because by default, this wouldn't draw the bottom line, we have to give it a list of indices. So because I've defined the vertices as bottom left, top left, top right, bottom right, then zero is bottom left, one is top left, and we create this list of indices to go from one point to another, from vertex one to vertex two, from two to three, and from three to zero, which draws the entire box. We use something called a spatial bundle to just to make sure that we have uh, what Bevy expects to be able to render something on screen. This includes things like the transform component. The bounding box is static, and it's going to be the polyline that we just talked about, which gives our vertice list as well as our indice list. This concept of defining vertices and indices might be something that you could see more if you were spending more time uh, looking at GPU rendering stuff. So it's actually useful to keep in mind, even though it's not a direct application here. And then of course we put this bounding box on the all layer and say that it collides with player one and player two. In this case, I've also mistakenly left a ball component on it. So you can see here that if I remove that ball component, it doesn't change anything about the way the program behaved. It was just a thing that I left in accidentally. So with that in mind, we've got everything set up. We've got the tiles, we've got the colliders for the tiles, we've got the balls, we've got the colliders for the balls. We drew a collider around the outside. Now what we need to do is when these balls hit tiles of the opposite color, we need them to change. And that is the ball collision system. Ball collision system queries for colliding entities, which is a component that comes from Bevy XPBD2D. And we query for the colliding entities for anything that has the ball component on it, which is the blue ball and the green ball, player one and player two. Then we also query for all of the tiles. In this case, I'm querying for the te tile texture index, which tells me whether it's a blue tile or a green tile, and the collision layers, because we need to swap them if we're gonna swap. We iterate over both of the balls, so this will be a loop of maximum two values. We check to see if the colliding entities for the ball is true or false. So if it's empty, if they're just hanging out in empty space or haven't hit anything, then we just continue. If not, then we do our collision detection logic. So for every entity that a ball is currently colliding with, we check to see if it's a tile by trying to get that tile entity using the entity ID from the colliding entities. So colliding entities, when we iterate over it, will give us an entity for every other entity that our ball is colliding with. If we can use that to access a tile from the tiles query, then we are colliding with a tile. Given that we have 
confirm that we are actually colliding with a tile. We then match on the texture index, which tells us whether it's index one or zero. If it's zero, remember our tile is green. If it's one, it's blue. So if it's zero, we need to flip it to blue and we need to flip the collision layers. So now it is on the player two layer and collides with the player one layer. Same thing for the other way, just flip from one to zero, flip the collision layers and everything's good to go. And one of the really fun things for me here is that we can make this as big or small as we want to. So if I make this 16 by nine, then we very clearly get larger tiles and I can full screen this and we can watch it go for a little while. Now, one thing I will say is there are a couple of bugs here, especially due to the way that I decided to handle uh, collisions. Because I'm checking that colliding entities set, we aren't checking whether the collision has just started, just ended, or is happening. So you can end up with slightly weird behavior like this blue ball going back and forth here, especially because of the size of the balls. So one improvement to this could be using the collision events, either the start collision event, the collision event, or the end collision event. And of course we could make this as big or as small as we want to. If we run it with 160 by 90 tiles, the balls are just moving way too slowly for us to see an effect in this video, <laughs> but it is quite fun. And similarly, because we've made this out of sort of a sprite sheet here, if we change our sprite sheet to be fully boxed out and not have these borders that we had in the first one, and if we use those no borders, then you can see this more fluid where you can't see the grid kind of uh, visualization. And obviously there's a whole lot more you could do here. If we head over to the Bevy ECS tile map examples and we go to the accessing tiles example, you can see some similar setup here, but also very notably, you can see that there are a bunch of utility functions for doing things like getting the neighboring positions. So if you can get the neighboring positions for a specific tile, you could, for example, add an effect using a shader whenever the ball impacts that drifts out over its neighbors and changes the color a little bit. You could use Bevy Hanabi or one of the other particle systems to give a little bit more of an impact, or you could add some audio. So that's it for today. Just this fun little example of an infinite pong game with no players. If you've got any questions, leave them in the comments and I will catch you in the next one. Have a great rest of your day.